Hello, and welcome to today's Crane Shares webinar Embracing Volatility, Investing in China's Market. My name is Brendan O'Hearn. I'm the Chief Investment Officer of Crane Shares Exchange Traded Funds. My colleague Jonathan Shellen, our Chief, Chief Operating Officer, and I are excited to host today's webinar. While visiting Shenzhen, China, and Hong Kong recently, I was struck at the contrast between how normal life appeared with the usual terrible traffic, crowded restaurants, and busy malls. The sky simply didn't appear to be falling. And yet Chinese equity markets have faced several fundamental and non-fundamental factors that have weighed on investor sentiment. While we believe that a market bottom may have been put in, we admittedly and unfortunately do not have a crystal ball. To help investors maintain a position in, their, in our growth-focused Crane Shares CSI China Internet ETF, ticker KWEB, which holds no exposure to slow, no-growth sectors such as banks, energy, industrials, materials, and real estate, Jonathan and our capital markets team led by James Mond have developed several ETFs that we will discuss today. Jonathan and James leveraging their backgrounds in portfolio and risk management, while leveraging KWeb's robust options market, which is a byproduct of KWeb being the largest China equity ETF listed outside of China, have developed a several strategies that we're going to discuss at length that we believe can be great tools for investors with a long-term perspective on both China as well as KWeb. Please proactively ask questions during the webinar as we will hope for a lively Q&A following the presentation. If you're viewing today's webinar on craneshares.com, please email any and all questions as well as webinar deck requests to info at craneshares.com. While those of you joining us on Zoom, please use the chat, uh, chat function. SEMA and CFP, CFP designations can receive a hour of continuing education credits by emailing us at CE, that's Charlie Edward, CE at craneshares.com. I'll briefly provide a quick overview for those of you less familiar with Crane Shares. Our founder, Jonathan Crane, formed two core beliefs during his experience living and building a successful business in China. These two beliefs were the basis for, for founding Crane Shares over 11 years ago. The first was that while new China sectors such as domestic consumption, internet, e-commerce, 5G, semiconductors, clean technology, and healthcare have become the new drivers of China's economic growth, these sectors are still under allocated in global portfolios. The second is that the opening of China's equity markets, the second largest in the world, as well as China's fixed income market, also the second largest in the world, their inclusion into global indices will have a significant effect on investors' portfolios. Most importantly, we endeavor to earn the trust of investors through our balanced, data-driven perspective on China's economy and capital markets. China's rise in market indices, along with its economy, will necessitate investors have a partner to navigate these developments. Crane Shares wants to earn that partnership role with you. We maintain a daily research blog that is available for free at www.chinalastnight.com, which we encourage you to subscribe in order to keep abreast of new developments as they occur on a daily basis. Taking John's vision, we've created a suite of China focused exchange traded funds. At the same time, we've taken many of the trends that we've seen in China and applied that to global equity markets. So on the next slide, we highlight several of the important themes that we see in both China as well as uh, the global equity markets, as well as we pioneered investing in carbon credit allowance futures with the first such ETF globally, KRBN. Um, and we maintain a robust data-driven perspective on changes in climate policy uh, by our head of climate, Luke Oliver. So let's dive right into the matter at hand. 
And I think one of the things we always want to discuss is stepping back big picture. That I think having spent time in Asia over the last two months, I've realized that many investors globally are significantly overweight on U.S. stocks. And while many investors will point out the underperformance of markets like China, the end reality is that the U.S. equity market has simply outperformed every market globally over the last 15 years. So, so since the global financial crisis low, the S&P 500 is up um, 892%, while MSCI All Country World is only up 272%. So while many, many investors have pointed to the underperformance of non-US equities, including emerging markets and China, the reality is investors globally, we believe, are very much overweight U.S. stocks. That 15 years um, is the reality is that's that's 60 quarterly meetings with your clients, opening your account statement, meeting with your investment committee, your board of directors, your trustees, and having to explain how you own these non-U.S. equities that always underperform. So the U.S. equity market is like a black hole. It's simply pulling money out of non-U.S. equities, and that includes Europe, emerging markets, and China, and going into an increasingly narrow number of securities. We really do believe, while we're not calling the U.S. equity market a bubble, we just simply believe it is a very crowded trade. And that's very much true for non-U.S. investors, because the U.S. dollar index, which bottomed in the beginning of 2011, is up over 40% since 2011. So while U.S. stocks have significantly outperformed, the U.S. dollar has aided and abetted that outperformance. Um, Non-U.S. investors, as we show in the next slide, have significantly increased their allocation to U.S. equities. That's simply holding... These non-U.S. equities, your home market, has led to significant outperformance. Diversification has not worked. The less you've allocated to U.S. equities, the worse you've done. How do you maintain these exposures over 60 quarterly client calls, investment committees, board meetings? It's simply become very, very difficult. At the same time, we think investors have a very short memory that we remember just not that long ago, 15 years. On the next slide, it was U.S. equities that were being abandoned. That From 1999 to 2009, U.S. equities significantly underperformed non-U.S. equities, including emerging markets in China. And following the second 50% decline, global investors gave up on U.S. equities. And lo and behold, that capitulation literally marked the bottom in U.S. stocks. And we believe that many of these same traits that we witnessed 15 years ago are being applied to non-U.S. equities, including both China and emerging markets. Now, specifically to China, on the next slide, there have been a number of factors that have weighed on investor sentiment. At the same time, many of these proverbial headwinds have dissipated or have at least lessened, have become less problematic. Um, and we do believe that many of the ongoing issues, such as U.S.-China diplomatic relationships, there is a movement to stabilize that, as we witnessed from the Biden G summit in uh, San Francisco late last year, as well as there are issues economically in China, such as the continuing real estate crisis. At the same time, in, in spending time in China, it was greatly recognized in meeting with investors, the greatest policy error ever by a central banker was the US Federal Reserve allowing Lehman Brothers to go bankrupt, which created a financial crisis. And in speaking to investors in China, they said, why, why would the Chinese government, the regulators allow a distressed real estate developer 
to create a financial crisis. It's not in their best interest. So, so real estate property developers are receiving a significant amount of policy support. At the same time, without question, the decline in property prices has weighed on domestic consumption. So there is an effort at the same time to increase, to stabilize property prices in China. And, and we see that China's economy is coming back. And it is being supported by the government. On the next slide, we highlight the many, many incremental measures taken by the Chinese government and policymakers to support the economy. At the same time, we've not seen the proverbial policy bazooka, the free money, the free checks in the mail that many Western countries uh, did and acted following that created Inflation that we're still dealing with, as, as evidenced by today's CPI print here in the United States, as well as creating more debt for those governments. Um, so, so the Chinese government and regulators are taking a cautious approach, believing that China's economy is going through a cycle and it is rebounding. It's just rebounding a little bit incrementally following the removal of zero COVID, the scar tissue related to that experience, as well as the effect of property prices on households and therefore affecting domestic consumption. Now, now at the same time, we've seen a fairly poor performance of Chinese equities over the last several years. Um, as we see on the next slide, that, that while the performance of, say, K-Web's performance over the last several years has fallen quite dramatically, we can see that these companies are hardly going out of business. At the same time, from a valuation perspective, we continue to see this divergence between U.S. tech and China tech. Um, this gap has only grown. And, and while we believe that, yes, themes like artificial intelligence are, are important, we think a bigger driver of U.S. equities is this money coming out of non-US markets into the US stock market. Um, and there's many, many examples as we'll show, but it's creating a very significant gulf on, as we show on the next slide between China tech and US tech. Um, this trend has reached a level of absurdity. On the next slide, with the market capitalization of Amazon, you can buy all 31 companies in K-Web and you'd have over half a trillion dollars left over. Does that make any sense to you? Especially considering Amazon has less revenue, less free cash flow, less net income, less earnings per share than aggregating the 31 companies in K-Web. This doesn't make sense unless you have investors just buying U.S. stocks, driving up those prices regardless of fundamentals. And again, we're not calling the U.S. market a bubble. At the same time, we have a very strong conviction it is a very crowded trade. Um, another example of the absurdity being exhibited in U.S. equity markets on the next slide is comparing Alibaba has a bond it's a bond issued here in the United States. It's, it's in U.S. dollars. It comes due later on this year. Would you believe that that bond has outperformed Alibaba's stock by 70% over the last five years? How can two different type of investors have such a diame diametrically different view of a company's outlook? Well, part of that is because equity investors are folks focused on sediment. Whereas fixed income investors, they break out their Hewlett Packard 12C calculator and say, can a company generate enough free cash flow to pay coupons as well as principal on its bond? And the answer is unequivocally yes. Yes, Alibaba can. Again, the only explanation for this disparity is investors coming out of non-US equities, including emerging markets in China and buying US stocks. Now, now more recently, over the last two months, 
Uh, there has been an interesting situation taking place, which we think is a marks a capitulation event. On the next slide, um, we've seen both Chinese um, indices in mainland China, as well as big benchmarks in Hong Kong, like the Hang Seng, fall very, very, very quickly over in, in the months of December and particularly in January. And we think what's happened is because all of this money has come out of non-U.S. equities, including EM in China, there's simply no buyers. That many investors have come out. You know, many U.S. investors came out of these investments due to uh, the trade war and tech war and zero COVID, internet regulation. And I think many European investors came out of the space due to what happened with Russian equities following Ukraine. And I think investors in Asia were a little bit later to come out of these securities because 2023, China was coming out of zero COVID and yet the market did decline and those investors who bought the diff suffered. So, so I think you've had this removal of potential buyers and that's led to a situation where a number of contracts issued in both mainland China called snowballs or in Hong Kong, they call them these callable bull bear contracts. These are levered upside contracts, but they have a liquidation level, and that's based on an index level. And that's whenever, say, the Hang Seng Index or um, indices in China, like the CSI 1000, a small, small cap benchmark, as the markets come down and there's no buyers, Issuing banks are forced to redeem these contracts, which means selling the underlying futures. And if there's no buyers, the market falls. Um, and we've seen this happen several times, which explains what we believe could be a signal of the bottom, that this liquidation event, this forced selling, creating more, more forced selling. And in fact, on the next slide, there has been one buyer, which is the Chinese government. And that we've seen very strong inflows into China equity ETFs listed in China. And we know that that's driven by long-term investors in China, like their sovereign wealth fund, asset management firms, are in actually buying the stock. And that's very similar to what we saw in this, the, the bottoming pro process that occurred in the summer of 2015, when Chinese equities came down, that actually the government came in as the buyer of last resort. Uh, many, many exchanges in Asia, including the Shanghai, Shenzhen, and Hong Kong, fail to have circuit breakers like we have here in the United States. Um, at the same time, we're seeing an uptake in policy geared to supporting China's economy. On the next slide, uh, already this year, we've seen a number of positive developments. Uh, despite these are being very strong measures implemented in China, we've still seen the market decline, again, driven by the liquidation of these contracts uh, against the background of an absence of buyers. But we think there's many positives taking place that the market has largely ignored. This makes me very bullish about the prospects for K-Web uh, following the end of Chinese New Year, uh, particularly the placement of a new head of their CSRC, their version of the SEC. Uh, the past two times a CSRC head has been replaced, markets have performed quite well, um, and we continue to see policy support for both the real estate sector, as well as for the broader economy. And we think that those measures are taking an effect in the economy. They're making their way into the real economy. At the same time, on the next slide, K-Web continues to be volatile. Um, and I think this is an area that's been a bit of frustration for investors in K-Web, including myself, um, that despite some of these positives taking place, we've not seen a meaningful rally, though, though again, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit more constructive that following Chinese New Year, we will do so. Um, but another intelligent investor uh, noticed this as well, which was my colleague, Jonathan. And, and Jonathan and our capital markets team, uh, uh, headed by James Mond, um, have spent considerable time and effort in examining ways to provide a potentially smoother ride for investors. And 
Um, on the next slide, Jonathan, um, I know this is an area that's been of such interest for yourself. So I want to I want to hand things off to yourself and really, really looking forward to your insights myself. Phenomenal. Brennan, thank you. That was an excellent overview and presentation. And I think uh, should give everybody um, pause and really thinking about the potential direction that KWeb takes here uh, following the Chinese Lunar New Year. Uh, what's really interesting is KWeb was launched as one of the first ETFs at Crane Shares over 10 years ago. And a funny thing happens when you launch an ETF. Over time, the ETF grows. Uh, and around it, an entire ecosystem starts to develop. You start having many more market makers involved, uh, making the prices much more efficient. But then you also have an options market that could uh, sp spring up and, and really uh, provide a whole other way of providing access to a particular strategy. So what's interesting is when we look at KWeb from an AUM standpoint, assets under management, it has over $5 billion in assets, ranking it in the top decile of all US ETFs by asset size. But what's really interesting is when you look at the options market that has sprung up around KWeb, it's really significant and even larger on a relative basis. Namely, uh, KWeb options rank in the top four when you look at uh, China emerging market and thematic ETFs, uh, and KWeb options uh, rank in the top 10 when you look at open interest and notional exposure. Uh, and this is amongst you know, 3,400 US ETFs. So it ranks in the 0.5% when thinking about the options market. And so what's exciting about this is it's allowed us to develop tools and build out a suite that produces patterns of return that are really quite unique. They're tied to KWeb, but they utilize KWeb volatility to achieve something that's a little bit different. So we're going to cover our suite today, um, and let's let's do that on starting on the next slide. So as we talked about, KWeb launched over 10 years ago and really represents, we think, the central way to get growth exposure to China. There are other ways to get exposure to Chinese equities, but by utilizing uh, the China internet theme, you're really getting uh, very direct and we think uh, uh, heightened exposure to Chinese growth. Uh, now, with that, of course, comes volatility, um, because like any other market, China's economy has an ebb and a flow, and in periods of rapid growth, KWeb's going to do well, but if China's economy has below average growth, um, or the consumer is parking cash on the sidelines instead of putting it to work, that too will affect the earnings of KWeb companies. So what we did last year um, was uh, quite a bit of research on what's known as the covered call space. And uh, covered call strategies are quite popular in, in the US uh, and, and globally, we believe, because what they do is they offer uh, a way of generating income or dampening volatility in a traditional equity market like the S&P or the NASDAQ and others. Um, and Upon doing our research, we noticed that uh, you know, KWeb has very attractive volatility characteristics that could allow us to produce income levels, uh, monthly distributions that exceed um, what's out there in the marketplace generally. So we launched Clip in January of 2023, um, utilizing this very deep and liquid options market uh, that's been created around KWeb. And that was our first foray into options-based strategy with KWeb. And just last week, we've taken this a step further by launching two buffered strategies around KWeb. KPro, which provides uh, a 100% buffer, in other words, striving for full downside protection uh, against losses, and KBuff, which provides 90% protection. 
Now, the way these strategies work is uh, that there is no free lunch per se if you're going to provide some level of downside protection. You also have to provide some uh, upside participation that's less than 100%. Um, and so what we've been able to do with uh, the expertise of James Mond, our head of capital markets, and the entire capital markets team is achieve what we think are very attractive upside uh, participation levels. So for KPRO, where you have a 100% downside buffer, there is a 22.69% upside cap over the next two years. And for KBUF, that requires you to place 10% of your capital at risk, that upside participation goes all the way up to 41.2% over this two-year term. Let's jump ahead to the next slide and give a little more focus to CLIP first, and then we'll talk in greater detail about KPRO and KBOF. So if you think about our covered call strategy CLIP, um, we're doing something that's fairly straightforward um, in a very, what we think, um, pure way. When we launched the strategy, we wanted it to be very transparent, very clear, very easy to understand. So if you think about KWeb, KWeb gives you uncertain downside and uncertain upside. Um, we know that there are periods where KWeb can perform very well. In fact, there have been many periods, as we'll show you later, where KWeb's up you know, over 100% over a one to two year period. Um, but we also know with that comes the downside. And KWeb, particularly in recent years, has had meaningful drawdowns. So what CLIP does is CLIP replaces that uncertain upside with a stream of income, something that is more predictable, um, something that is more regular, and something that dampens the volatility of KWeb because it gives you this cushion of premium income. And our methodology uh, has us paying out that premium income each month. So we don't cap it, we don't hold it back. Whatever we earn in a given month is something that we pay out in the following month. Let's jump ahead, please. Now, what makes CLIP so unique in the marketplace is this volatility profile that KWeb has. Many of the popular covered call writing strategies in the industry are based on the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ or the Russell 2000. And what you'll find is that when you look at the historical volatility, how variable the returns for KWeb are at any given point in time, they are almost universally more volatile than these other indexes. And not just by a little bit, by a lot. In, case, in some cases, multiples of the volatility, say, of the S&P 500. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important because if you have a covered call writing strategy and you're writing short-term calls, as we are, you'll find that there's a very clear relationship between the volatility of the marketplace that you're writing calls on and the income that you can produce. So let's take a look at that on the next slide. So looking at you know, what is effectively a real-time snapshot of volatility, you can see on the left-hand slide, the S&P is operating somewhere in the 10 to 15% range. And as you go into more risky U.S. markets like the NASDAQ or the Russell 2000 small cap universe, you could see the volatility increasing. And KWeb's volatility recently is really in the mid-30s. Um, this is implied volatility that's embedded in the pricing of the options for all these markets. And you, if you look at the chart on the right, you see the relationship, and it looks like it's linear, um, and it's pretty close to linear, uh, and uh, what this representation is, is the relationship between the volatility and the amount of income that you can produce in any given month. So while the S&P 500 can generate income that's sub 2% in a given month, given the implied volatility of its options, something like China Internet is upwards of 4%. And in fact, when we launched CLIP um, earlier last year, we were generating income levels that were in the 5% range 
Um, they have since come down as implied volatility has come down, but it's actually ticked up more recently. And I can tell you that when we did our last roll of options this past Friday, we were writing options that had a 4.3% 30-day yield. Now, these are 30-day results. In other words, when we talk about 4%, we're talking about 4% a month, leading to very attractive annual distribution rates. Let's jump to the next slide, please. Just to put a finer point on that, here is the 12-month distribution rate history for CLIP. And you can see that in the far right column, the numbers started in the fives and have dipped uh, just to below 4% at the end of 2023. But as the volatility has picked up a bit, we're now writing options in the 4% range. So not surprisingly, the distribution rate, which is an annualized calculation, shows us somewhere in the upper 40s as an annualized distribution rate. Now, this is very attractive to investors that are building income portfolios. So if you're building an income portfolio that has uh, dividend paying stocks, high yield bonds, and other uh, asset categories that are designed to increase your yield or your cash distributions, this is a very important part of a strategy like that because it tends to have higher distribution rates, higher return of cash than you would in some of those other strategies. Now, mind you, it does create the risk, um, as we found, of generating quite a bit of cash. And so you have to be careful to be disciplined in your rebalancing and reinvesting of the cash that's produced by CLIP. Um, and we found uh, our investors to be comfortable with that kind of risk and very pleased to reinvest those proceeds uh, back into CLIP, into KWeb, or some other type of strategy. Now, keep in mind, these are the distribution rates. Last year was a very difficult year for KWeb. And what I'd like to do is spend maybe a minute on the total return profile as well, because not every investor is a pure income investor. Some investors like to look at things from a total return perspective. So last year, uh, CLIP's total return was up over 9%. Uh, against KWeb's return over the same period of minus 21%. So CLIP outperformed KWeb by over 30% in 2023 over the consistent time period. Now, that's not surprising. You know, we expect in years where KWeb is challenged in performance for CLIP to outperform. But what I think is also important is that CLIP provided this outperformance with about a third the volatility of KWeb. CLIP had volatility of 19% last year annualized, whereas KWeb was 30%. So you had about a third plus reduction in volatility. Again, not surprising. This is in fact the, the very goal of covered call strategies. So just putting a finer point on that, uh, last year KWeb had eight months out of 12 where it lost money. Challenging year indeed. CLIP had six months out of eight where it lost money. But the difference isn't so much uh, exemplified by the number of months, but really the average uh, returns in those periods. So for CLIP in down months, the average return was down 2%. For KWeb in down months, the average return was down 7%. So that's a 5% differential. And again, not exactly a surprising outcome given the amount of income that CLIP is producing each and every month. And, and we highlighted July and August here just to give you a really clear example of how CLIP works. In a rip-roaring rally, uh, yes, technical terms, in a rip-roaring rally like July, KWeb is up 17%. CLIP is going to lag KWeb in that kind of environment. It's not designed to give you full upside participation. It's allowed it's designed to give you income. In a month like August, where KWeb experiences a drawdown, uh, CLIP is going to cushion that downside by generating income. And quite frankly, what normally happens in drawdown environments is that volatility spikes in the income producing power of, of CLIP actually increases on the margin. So you tend to have incrementally better results. So again, a very difficult year for KWeb 
we believe that CLIP accomplished its goals. If you look at the, the daily returns, you could see it clipped the tails, pardon the pun, but it is designed to reduce the broad range of outcomes while producing a considerable amount of cash. Let's jump ahead now and pivot a little bit to the newest funds that we launched, KBuff and KPro. Um, now these strategies are different than CLIP because we're not just investing in KWeb and uh, selling calls. We're also using puts. Um, so what we're able to achieve is for different levels of downside protection with those puts, we're able to achieve varying levels of upside. Now, it's important to note one of the, I think one of the most important features here, and this is what allows these strategies to achieve these types of upside participation rates, is that these are two-year strategies. These are strategies that have an outcome period from effectively now or last week when we launched them through January of January 16th, 2026, when the underlying options that we use expire. So we are owning two-year options in these strategies. Um, and it's very important to look at the outcomes that you're going to achieve as an investor in these strategies over this full two-year period. Now, they are ETFs. They are marked to market every day. They're fully liquid, so you can buy them and sell them uh, at your heart's content. But it is really important to recognize that this outcome period is really a full two-year period or nearly a two-year period. Now, some of you may recognize that these strategies are very much like what private banks have been delivering for their clients using structured products. And there are certainly similarities. Um, some of the features we talk about, downside protection or buffered protection, uh, capped upside, these are all features that are really commonly known in the private banking space using structured products. But there are big differences between creating these structures in an ETF versus a structured product. The first big difference is that our management fee for managing these strategies is 25 basis points, 0.25%, which, you know, by my estimates, is probably a tenth of the costs that are embedded in traditional structured products. The other thing is they are fully liquid. They have a daily nav. They're priced throughout the day on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, and, uh, and so you can buy them and sell them. Whereas if you buy a traditional structured product from a private bank, there may be liquidity or limited liquidity, but there may also be a large cost associated with liquidating uh, those uh, securities. Um, I should also note for our European uh, viewers here that while KWeb is in fact available uh, as a U.S. listed ETF on the New York Stock Exchange and also as a USITS fund listed on the London Stock Exchange, uh, neither CLIP, KPRO, or KBUFF are available anywhere currently but the New York Stock Exchange. So I wanted to point that out. Um, we do see global investors purchasing from the New York Stock Exchange, um, but I just wanted to be very clear that these are currently only available uh, in New York. So uh, let's jump ahead and talk a little bit about how we create uh, KPRO and KBA. So it's really a three-step process, and the first two steps are identical for each one. Um, we buy KWeb, so we own the underlying ETF. We then uh, sell out-of-the-money KWeb call options, and we sell them in a way to finance the purchase of at the money or out of the money put options. So let's take KPRO as an example. When we launched KPRO, KWeb's price was $24.42. So what we needed to do to protect the downside is to buy put options at $24.42. And we could identify how much those put options cost. As we said, there's a deep liquid options market um, even going out two years. So when we assess the value of what those puts cost, we asked ourselves, well, how, how far out do we have to go in selling call options? How far out of the money do we have to go to finance the purchase of those puts? And 
that's how we arrived at the 22.69% uh, upside participation. Now, as you can imagine, if in the case of KBUF, instead of buying at the money puts, we were able, able to buy slightly out of the money puts, puts that were 10% below KWEB's current price, those puts are cheaper. And because those puts are cheaper, the call options that we sell to finance those puts could be either even further out of the money than those for K Pro. And that gave us upside participation of 41.2%. So just to put that into perspective, if you buy KBuff today and KWeb rallies above 41% over these next two years, you're going to receive a 41.2% return before taking into account our management fee of 25 basis points a year. So it's a very attractive risk reward profile, in my opinion. In fact, I was one of the earlier investors um, in K Pro and KBuff, and I bought them each. I bought them 50 50 because that allows me to have only 5% downside exposure, but giving me the ability to have close to 30% upside potential if KWeb rallies to those levels and beyond. So really a 6x plus in terms of risk reward, which I think in this day and age is hard to find. Uh, let's jump to the next slide, please. So here are some basic charts that show you the behavior in different extreme environments uh, for KWeb. And then, you know, we'll after this, we'll end by looking at real historical KWeb results, but uh, you could see here that not surprisingly in an extreme bear market, um, you would expect KBuff to be down 10% and KPro to be down zero. And again, these are pre-management fees, which are uh, 25 basis points a year. In a regular kind of run-of-the-mill bear market for KWeb down 30%, uh, KBuff down 10% still, K Pro zero still. Um, and then you could see what happens on the other side. If KWeb rallies 30% over the next two years, you would receive the full 30% with KBuff because that 30% is below the cap, but you would not receive the 30% for K Pro because the cap is 22.69%. Um, and then you can see that uh, the same logic extends to the, the most positive scenario that we're presenting here. Now, many of you are not probably asking is what I'd be asking at this stage as well. How does this compare to what's happened historically, given that you have a 10 year historical performance period for KWeb? What does the two year return profile of KWeb actually look like? And so we've done that in our last slide in discussing these funds, which is um, on the next slide. So the slide on the left shows you rolling two-year returns using daily returns going back to the launch of KWeb. So the first data point emerges in 2015, and this goes through uh, early February. And what we've done is we've color-coded the band of outcomes that are represented by KPro and KBuff. KPro is the pink band, so that goes from a 0% return up to 22.69. And the KBuff band, the blue band, goes from a minus 10% up to 41.2. And what you'll find by looking at the historical performance slide on the left, um, and also the histogram of the same data on the right, is that you know KWeb has lost money over a two-year period roughly 44% of the time. Now, if you take Brendan's comments into account, uh, that's a little bit misleading because a lot of that has been weighed down by what we've seen happen just in the last three, three or so years since uh, the peak of KWeb's price back in February of 21. So there's a lot of bias in the data based on how poorly KWeb has done recently but it's, it's also what creates the opportunity in my mind. Imagine this, if you're gonna buy a strategy like this on the S&P 500, I view it practically as dead money. 
The S&P is at extremely frothy valuations. Um, and there's a higher probability, in my opinion, of the S&P 500 delivering a flat return over the next two years than many global investment categories that have not participated in this unbelievable rally of the last you know, near decade. So in an interesting way, if you're thinking about a return on your capital, it's possible that if you were to buy some structured strategy around the S&P and held it for two years, the likelihood of achieving a zero return or worse is actually pretty high given where we are in market cycles. Uh, whereas with K-Web, given that it's coming off of very extreme drawdowns, we believe that there's a higher probability of achieving uh, a strong upside return over the next two years. Um, and you could see that there are certainly periods of time historically where K-Web has done very well over two-year periods, oh, up over 100% several times. Um, so you may be asking, what am I really getting then if I buy K-Pro from a historical standpoint? Well, if you were to buy K-Pro, you're avoiding the 44% of time that K-Web would have lost money over a two-year period, but you're also giving up the 30% of time where K-Web exceeds the 22.69% cap. So you've limited your distribution of outcomes to just 26% of all of the outcomes that K-Web historically experienced. And if you apply that same mathematics to K-Buff, you're basically uh, reducing your pattern of returns to just 40% of the historical outcomes. So these are really important tools for professional portfolio builders that want to achieve a defined outcome that's unique and differentiated from what K-Web has done historically and from what K-Web will do in the future. You know, we have to be very clear that if this is an ideal entry point for K-Web and K-Web's performance, investing in a strategy that limits downside and limits upside is going to produce uh, a worse return in those extreme upside scenarios. Uh, we're very proud of the suite that we've delivered. Um, we think that it addresses many of the demands that clients have been sharing with us uh, over the last few years as, as they've seen exacerbated volatility. And I just want to um, emphasize that we'll continue to innovate and build strategies around our client needs, um, adding to our toolkit and suite of strategies that leverage K-Web and the options market. At this time, I'd like to hand things back to Brendan um, to wrap up and start us off with Q&A. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, that was fantastic, Jonathan. Um, and again, you know, for questions, uh, if you're joining us uh, on craneshares.com, please email us at info at craneshares.com, as well as uh, for those of you joining us on Zoom, there is the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, just uh, type away. Um, you know, NetNet, -Net, you know, there are opportunities, we believe, for KWeb to rally following Chinese New Year. I mean, one of the questions from our uh, uh, good, good friend, um, uh, Jonathan, um, is, is about, you know, what are, what are some of these potential catalysts? And we think it's continued policy support. We're apt to see some IPOs, uh, from Chinese companies, such as, uh, the fast fashion retailer Sheen coming to public. There's been talk about does Pin Duo Duo spin off Temu, uh, their U S e-commerce unit. Um, certainly TikTok and ByteDance, there's been talk about, you know, would, would ByteDance spin off TikTok considering its large U.S. investor base? Um, and lastly would be Ant Financial that, uh, could Ant Financial come? Uh, but I think we're more apt to see more policy supporting both the economy and specifically directed to real estate, um, as well as we're seeing this intervention 
uh, from the Chinese government, where they're actually buying the stock market in mainland China, which which again helped stabilize the market back in 2015. Uh, so we think there's a number of positive that the market has largely ignored. Uh, maybe maybe this liquidation event that's taken place um, over the last uh, call it two months has overshadowed that lack of buyers. So so ultimately we we do believe that uh, the equity markets are a a weighing machine, though they can be a voting machine in the short run. And for that reason, you know, Jonathan and James and the team have developed uh, what what I, I certainly believe as a shareholder in Clip, as well as obviously KWeb, is some ways for for investors to be able to navigate uh, some of the volatility. And certainly, uh, K Pro and K Buff, um, I think, are great tools uh, for investors to mitigate some of that volatility or even even for myself as a long run investor um, i can see these products being used in my my portfolio uh, to help mitigate some of that day to day volatility and um, again i think you know most importantly we're we're here we're always available uh, to answer any questions um, and i think i think Jonathan, you know, we've got a, a two different sets of vacate uh, types of questions some of them are a little bit more about uh, the beginning part of the presentation, um, and maybe, maybe I'll just knock one or two of those out. Um, you know, one of them, a few questions around uh, the geopolitical situation. Then I'll defer, you know, Jonathan, just to get into some of it. We've got some uh, some great questions about uh, K Buff and K Bro, uh, K Pro, as well as Clip um, around the U.S. election. And uh, I think one of these we'll we'll be doing um, in the not too distant future is. Uh, we've we're, we're friends with Terry Branstad, the long-running governor of Iowa, who um, served as the U.S. ambassador to China under President Trump. And um, you know, obviously, a lot can happen between now and November. Um, but you know, certainly, I think one of the things Terry Terry you know tells us is that um, you know Trump was never anti-China. He's a business person. Um, he's looking to make deals. And, and I think, if anything, China is more receptive to that deal making uh, going forward. That China's economy is very geared to the West, um, its exports to Asia, Europe and the United States. Um, that's part of the reason why uh, we've been uh, very dismissive of a potential invasion of Taiwan that uh, China China's economy cannot afford to be ostracized like Russia. Uh, so certainly, certainly we believe that uh, China has a strong interest um, in, in raising its profile with foreign corporations, foreign investors. And I think President Xi's speech at APAC, which I recommend um, um, all investors should read. You know, he spoke about the Flying Tigers and his experience visiting Iowa and San Francisco. Uh, I think there has been a, a change in the tone and tenor uh, to the outside world. So, so I think you know, we'll we'll keep you abreast. Please stay subscribed to CraneShares.com and uh, ChinaLastNight.com, and we'll, we'll we'll try to get this Terry Brandstad uh, conversation in in the next few weeks or months. Uh, but you know, more sp specific to these new these new ETFs, uh, Jonathan, uh, you mentioned you mentioned um, trying to get these up and running. Now, certainly, USITS is a little bit structurally different. But you know, do you think it's feasible to get these products in a usage usage structure for European investors? I, I think it's possible. It's something that we um, are researching right now. You can't um, you can't have them look exactly the same way. In other words, um, for a couple of reasons. One, there is not a, a K Web options market uh, on the K Web mm -hmm. usits, um, and um, so we could not own the K Web usits fund and the options. There, are, <clears throat> excuse me, some restrictions also in usits about owning things like options in a usits fund. So we would have to approach it more synthetically using uh you know possibly some other synthetic variation but really trying to achieve similar outcomes okay um and specific to clip you know we had a few questions that you know uh, we throw off this this high yield uh but one investor said you know 
you know, we go X dividends. So the NAV drops the amount we're paying out. So, so is that always going to negate itself? I mean, in your slide, you showed how, how clip can have positive returns and maybe, maybe can you speak to the, that, that dynamic of, yes, we're writing a call uh, and we do pay that out, but it, right. it doesn't, it doesn't mean that the two offset one another. Right. So if you, the way to think about it is if K web's price stays exactly the same, we're going to write an option at the beginning of the month. And let's say that option produces 4% option income. Um, so we've now been provided with that cash. And let's say over the period of the month, uh, but mind you, we're also short that option. So in our NAV, in our calculation of the net asset value of Clip, we now are long, you know, four million of cash. We're short, you know, four million dollars worth of this option, and so it, that at that moment it has no effect on our NAV. Um, as the month goes on, and the time value reduces that option value that we're short decays. And what that means is every day on average, we're earning 20 to 30 basis points. And then by the end of the month, we fully earn that option premium. The option expires either worthless or gets called away. Um, and then we pay out that $4 million of cash. That brings down our NAV, um, but only if, only if, uh, K-Web's price has gone down, what you would expect to happen if K-Web's price remained flat is that every day our NAV would go up a little bit by 20 to 30 basis points. So, you know, said differently, if Clip had a uh, $30 NAV and uh, we earned a 4% option premium, then you would expect over the course of the month for Clip's NAV to go up to 3120 which is the 4%. And then at the end of the month, we pay out that $1.20, so it gets back down to 30. So if KWEB's price does not decline, then CLIP's price will also not decline even after we make distributions. The challenge that we had last year is that KWEB was down 20%. And so that put downward pressure on the NAV of, of CLIP. Again, it doesn't mean that our total returns were negative. We meaningfully outperformed KWeb. Um, but it, you know the the way covered call strategies work is that you're substituting uncertain upside for a more uh, stable income, but you're still holding on to the downside. And while the income is buffering the downside and helping you cut those tails, you still have some of those tails embedded in the structure. And, and that was really the motivator for us to buy or for us to develop K-Pro and K-Buff because some of our investors said, look, I love the income component of Clip, but what I'm really looking for is a, a more protected way of investing in K-Web. Um, and, and so that was a lot of the catalyst behind the new strategies that we're talking about today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's certainly, um, yeah, you know, obviously last year was, was, was challenged, but you'd expect, you know, normally you'd have some movement there, which would, you know, help there. Um, one of the, one of the questions just, you know, certainly as, as, uh, you had the great slide showing, you know, S&P 500, NASDAQ 100, Russell, Russell 2000, um, then, then K-Web, um, you know, do you think this period of vol how how sustainable? You know, from our yeah. friend Jonathan, got it, how sustainable is this volatility regime that we're seeing relative to maybe the historical? Sure. Um, you know, how do you do we have kind of forecast what that how that volatility could change potentially? So the volatility right now that we're seeing, and and again, this is. This chart here is uh, what's known as realized volatility. So this is like the actual, you know, looking back, uh, I think, 30 days or so uh, for each of these indexes. And it does seem elevated right now. But when we look at implied volatility going back um, since the options market developed around K-Web, 
we see that we're only slightly elevated now. We're in the high 30s. The long-term average is closer to the low 30s. So while having income levels that are in the fours are higher than historical average, um, the historical average would be somewhere in the mid threes. So if you were to ask me, you know, with mean reversion, where does um, where does monthly income go? Uh, somewhere in the mid threes, and and that's where it was trending, by the way, um, over the last twelve or so months until we had this recent spike uh, in implied volatility uh, here towards the end of January. So uh, again you're going to see because we aren't smoothing we're not holding back you're going to actually see the distributions in clip very much match the income that we are collecting from writing calls um you know that is not a fluke that's a feature um we want that uh, pass through to happen we want investors to effectively receive what we receive in writing these calls mm -hmm. and these uh I mean, obviously, these two ETFs just listed, so you know we're not seeing a lot of on-screen uh, volume at, at at this point. But but you know, I think our anticipation is that will evolve over time. That's very similar to K Web uh, back in uh, 2013. You know, it, it kind of traded very uh, yeah. at, at times by appointment, but but as the fund grew, you saw um, an increase in and market makers competing for order flow, tightening spreads. And I think I think that well, we, this, we anticipate that same evolution for K Pro and K K Buff. I, you know. Right. And and look, the reality is, and we would encourage, there are some people in this audience that could probably do this themselves. Um, but there is a wrinkle. Um, you could kind of do it yourself, but let me explain when we're managing, you know, K Pro and K Buff how it might differ from what you would do if you were to attempt to do this on your own. Um, one is we're an institutional buyer, right? We have phenomenal connections through our capital markets team, which is a best in class capital markets and portfolio management team with the street. So we can get efficiencies and buying options that may be hard for other investors to achieve. Mm -hmm. The second thing that we're doing is we're using flex options. Now these are SIBO listed options, but they allow for a degree of customization. So when I talked about launching these funds when K-Web was at $24.42, when we were transacting in these options, and for K-Pro, for example, our puts are exactly at $24.42. Um, they're not at $24.50 or $25 or $24. We were able to get precise match to the K-Web price and the option price. Um, that's because we're using what are called flex options. Flex options allow for certain customization. The other customization that we utilize using flex options is that we like these options to be European. We, that means that they can only be exercised at the very end, uh, at January 16, 2026. If you buy a standard listed option through your Fidelity account or what have you, you're going to get an American option. American options can be exercised at any time. That could be disruptive. It could be operationally burdensome. So these are the types of things that we're able to do, again, using a very deep liquid options market, but achieving a level of customization that might be difficult for certain investors to achieve on their own. If they want to try, they could certainly do it. Um, and we wouldn't be opposed because you're still going to invest in K-Web as part of that strategy, which, which is good for us and hopefully good for you. But we think that given the cost benefit of having us do this for 25 basis points a year, um, it's a very effective way of gaining these exposures without having to do any of this heavy lifting. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you know, just one question was around, uh, do you have an accumulating a non-distributive non share class? And we don't uh, for, say, CLIP, just because you, you get taxed whether or not you receive the income or not. So we do just pay it out. Um, right. And that that's similar to another question from Chuck, uh, just asking about, uh, do we have a drip plan for for CLIP? Uh, certainly appreciate you and your wife holding CLIP, Chuck. Uh, that's something I've not heard of for an ETF. So we'll have to do some investigating there. I mean, obviously you can reinvest your 
um, your monthly distribution, which would go back into purchasing more shares, uh, commission free. But um, I'll, you know, we'll have to look into the drip. I'm, I'm aware of drip plans for stocks. I've not, I'm not, not seen that for uh, ETFs, candidly. So we'll yeah. do some digging. Yeah, and we've we've done a little bit so far, and what we found is that it's very much uh, broker by broker. Some brokers will allow you to set your clip distributions on auto reinvest. Um, others will not. Um, but we found that we, uh, Crane, mm -hmm. um, while we can have a recommendation to brokers and even to the Depository and Trust Clearing Corp, um, they're merely recommendations. Ultimately, the brokers uh, get to apply their own framework. So um, again, I think it's a very important point because if you're like me and you uh, you know you you're busy and you you miss three months of reinvesting clip distributions, you now have you know twelve to fifteen percent of excess cash related to that position uh, that you have to put to work. So very important to keep an eye on things. The other thing I'll mention is, um, and, and you heard me say this about KPro and KBuff. I use those two funds in combination. Mm -hmm. So I put those together to build my own kind of custom risk and reward. Um, investors are doing that with uh, Clip and uh, KWeb and actually felt very good last year in doing so because by combining Clip and KWeb, you achieved a uh, better return outcome, lower volatility, um, but then still maintained the ability to achieve KWeb upside. So we're hearing a lot of you know traditional KWeb investors blending um, two of these strategies. And we think now with the advent of KPro and KBuff, there will be variations that we haven't even considered yet. Um, as you can imagine, there are now literally hundreds and hundreds of combinations that you could put together just using the four ETFs that are on this slide. And just with uh, with KPro, you know, one of the questions is, is there a scenario where I can lose money with uh, KPro? So in any interim period, right? So for example, if KWeb um, is down significantly in a short period of time, and there's still a lengthy period of time between now and the end of the outcome period, the NAV of KPro can fall. Can fall. Now it's not gonna fall as significantly as KWeb because the put options that KPro holds are going to um, be worth much more as KWeb declines in value. But I, I want to be very clear that the your, your NAV is not protected day in and day out before the end of the outcome period. But at the end of the outcome period, uh, these funds seek to deliver an outcome that is fully protected based on the uh, initial price of this fund, so right around $25. Um, so that's also very important. If KWeb rallies 20, 30, 40%, KPro's NAV is gonna increase mm -hmm. um, and it's gonna start to move in the direction of that cap. Again, it's not gonna, even if KWeb goes up 30% very quickly, KPro's NAV is not gonna go up 30% because there's still a lot of time left to the end of the outcome period. But in that scenario, there's there's also downside risk. So it's very important for investors to achieve the stated outcome of these strategies to get invested now, to get invested around the $25 price to achieve the full benefit of what's embedded in these strategies. Mm -hmm. And again, I think um, you know we're we're just over the hour mark, but you know we've a few questions just around you know concerns around uh, investing in China, and I think uh, K Pro and K Buff I think are great solutions to overcoming some of those challenges. And um, while while certainly you know we believe sediment can improve and the Chinese economy will continue to improve, um, you know it's very you know we're not we're not saying we can predict the future, but we can help mitigate some of the outcomes with these uh, with these solutions like KPro, KBuff and and Clip for that matter as well. And I think, you know, it's been frustrating at times to see U.S. multinationals that are highly geared to China have no beta, no correlation to many of these same geopolitical concerns 
You know, if you're worried about Taiwan, what does that mean for Apple or Nvidia, right? You know, it's they they have no they they bear no risk premium to those same concerns. You know, thus it's thus been the Chinese equities and at, at the same time we think that there is policy support, there are positives coming and um you know, I'm, I'm personally quite constructive on K-Web at, at this juncture, but at the same time, you know, we've got some great solutions to, to help mitigate. Um, any, anything else that, you know, Jonathan, that wasn't answer or questions that, that you felt was important to convey? I think we covered a lot of ground, Brendan, and uh, grateful as always for your insights and addressing what I think are really the most timely questions from our investors. You no, know, and certainly if you wake up tomorrow or the day after or would like to receive the presentation, uh, please email us any at any point to info at craneshares.com. And with that, just thank you again for this opportunity. Inter in introduce these great innovative products and congratulations to Jonathan James and team for uh, their efforts on the behalf of our shareholders.